So thanks for joining us today, everybody, for the session on valuable AWS programs for private equity. Really appreciate everybody joining. My name is Jacob Dante Leffler. I am the VP of Client Achievement at Kiktrum. And Kiktrum's mission is to partner with technology investors and executives to accelerate enterprise value. Today, our speaker is Jeremy Hicks. And Jeremy has more than 15 years of experience developing solutions for enterprise clients. At Kickdrum specifically, Jeremy leads our programs responsible for design, development, delivery of technology solutions that transform and modernize business operations for our customers and their customers. In addition, Jeremy manages Kickdrum's deep AWS relationship, coordinating programs for training, migration, modernization, and all of these funding opportunities you're gonna hear about today through the AWS partner programs, including over $30 million in cloud migrations to date that Jeremy has personally been involved in as part of Kickdrum. So Jeremy, welcome today. Uh, I will turn it over to you and I will interrupt you throughout with questions, I am sure, because uh, we've got a good group of people here that are uh, chomping at the bit to hear about all these programs. So take it away. Fantastic, thanks Jacob. Glad to be here, glad to have everyone in attendance. Um, and really excited to talk about some of these programs that uh, we can help you tap into when it comes to AWS uh, throughout the course of the life cycle of a, an acquisition and a hold uh, of a company. So I just wanted to start out with just a few things that you should be aware of uh, when it comes to AWS and some programs that you can tap into. We're going to dive into details on these later on. But uh, just so you know, if you're planning to move to the cloud, uh, you should work with AWS to get an assessment done. Uh, that'll provide details and an ROI and a business case around your move to the cloud. Uh, and then there's a lot of funding that AWS can provide to actually help move you into AWS, uh, whether that's coming from a data center environment or another cloud provider. You should also know that if you have more than, I would say about 15,000 a month in AWS spend, uh, there are ways that you can get access to third-party tools that will help you analyze your spend, your usage, and make predictions about what might happen with your costs in the future and where you can save some money. Uh, also, and this number, the 500,000 annually in AWS, that's a bit of a soft number. It varies quite a bit, but uh, know that when you start to get to that number, you should think about private pricing discounts. Those are things that you'll wanna discuss with your account manager at AWS and find out what might be available to you in that regard. Also, if you have uh, a substantial number of cloud employees, really 10 or more, uh, then think about a custom training plan. Do an analysis of your team's needs, where they're sitting today, uh, and how you can level them up and make sure that they have all the best current knowledge about AWS and just cloud in general. And then finally, you know, if you have a private equity investor, which I think given the, the title of this particular webinar, it's pretty likely you do. Uh, then there are other discounts, there are incentives, and there's teams that are here to help you uh, both on the Kicktrum side as well as ones on the AWS side that we work very closely with. So let's talk a little bit more about the details of that. And really what I wanna do with this session is talk about as you're going through the life cycle, where you can tap into these programs and how they can help you in each stage of your life cycle. So let's start from the left-hand side uh, with the beginning of the PE life cycle and start with your exclusivity period, your assessment period prior to actually performing the transaction, and then that first 100 days or so immediately after the transaction. When you're looking at that phase, there's some technical diligence that can be done uh, actually done by AWS and assist you with whatever your thesis may be in order to identify the right platforms, the right programs that are available for you uh, when you're making a move to AWS or if already in AWS, how you can really manage that well. There's cost optimization reports that'll help you understand what kind of a bottom line you can get to on your AWS spend. There's learning needs analysis for your teams. And then we can look at things like evaluating for a migration, or doing a well-architected review to make sure that you're using best practices with your deployment. Once you move into the hold period, you've got a cloud migration and modernization. Uh, that's really one of the main drivers here 
in terms of funding from AWS, something called the Migration Acceleration Program that we'll get into a bit more detail about uh, when we go into some of the subsequent slides. But also bear in mind, as you're running through the operational phase, training and certification is going to be important to make sure that your team is leveled up to the right degree uh, and some credits that you can get for any sort of new programs that you may be rolling out, especially if you have some POCs or things like that that you might want to look into. Finally, when we move into really the meat of the hold period, uh, the operation growth and cost takeout phase, there's that POC funding available to you. You should also start to talk about some of the discount plans that can be available. Uh, private pricing agreements and enterprise discount plans are two different ways of talking about really just service type of agreements that can give you discounts for you committing to a certain amount of spend. And then again, we keep touching on training and exercise, making sure that your team knows how to use AWS in the most efficient way possible and keep your investment secure. So we're going to dive into each of these as we kind of move through this life cycle. And let's start with the assessment and transaction phase. So first with this, regardless of what target you're talking about, there's a private equity team at AWS uh, that the Kitrum team works pretty closely with and can help with identifying what you should do post acquisition. Uh, if you have a specific thesis in mind, they can help you with investigating and defining how to implement that thesis in a way that meets your goals and objectives. So that thesis might be a carve out or a migration, it may be a merger or roll up, or you may have some idea around generative AI. Of course, that's a very hot topic right now. Uh, nowhere is that more true than at AWS. Gen AI is a, a big item for them as well. So if you have any thoughts on where you're going to go with the transaction uh, and you want to talk to a team that really knows how to apply some of the best practices, some of the newer technologies, that team at AWS is really going to help with that. And then once we uh, start to dive into where your target is, we can make some other recommendations. So if they're already in AWS, for example, there's a technical diligence team that can look at their AWS environment, use some tooling that's only available to AWS experts, and make recommendations for you around risk, security, and infrastructure. And that's a good complement to any sort of assessment that you might be doing on your own or with a partner like Kicktrum that does a risk analysis, that does a security analysis, and provides you recommendations. That AWS team will augment that, uh, that report and just provide you with some more details. And then, as I mentioned before, the cost optimization report, looking at an AWS environment and really identifying those areas where there's some immediate cost savings potential once you take over ownership of that company. And so you can come up with a plan for the first 100 days to reduce the costs, shore up any sort of risks that may be there, uh, and make sure that you're ready for the growth phase. Outputs from that, we're going to talk about technical diligences. They may give you a roadmap based on uh, what the thesis was, and then those savings opportunities. Now, if they're not in AWS, of course, AWS still wants to be very involved in that transaction as soon as you're able to bring them into it. There's a couple of things that can be done here. The first is what we call the migration evaluator. So if it's a data center environment or if it's another cloud provider, you can look at what those costs are for services in those environments and put together a good plan around what it'll look like to have that spend be in AWS, have that infrastructure in AWS, and use real data from that migration evaluator tool to develop a projected cost and ROI for making that move over to AWS. And then, as I mentioned before, a learning needs analysis is a way to survey the team that exists today, understand where their skill sets lie, and create a plan for leveling them up, making sure they have the right level of understanding of how to use tools like AWS. That's especially important if you're making an acquisition where somebody is not in a cloud environment today, really want to understand what they do understand when it comes to the basics of cloud and when it comes to AWS specific products. So outputs from that, we'll have a TCO analysis. 
We'll also have an inventory ready for you so that you have the full understanding of what the infrastructure picture looks like. And then some uh, projections around what your ROI would look like, what instances you should use if you do make that move to AWS and our custom training plans. So at this point, you'll have a very good understanding based on the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that's in place today, whether it is or is not in AWS uh, and what the skills are of that team to help you make that purchase decision. Hey, Jeremy, we've got one question already uh, on this section. This one Great. comes from Steve. He, he asks, how do we get in touch with the AWS private equity team about an upcoming transaction that we're considering? Yeah, that's great. So it sounds like we have some deal team folks on the call today. Uh, so fantastic question. Uh, the private equity team at AWS is uh, somewhat of a, a non-public facing in, in some ways. They certainly do engage and reach out to folks. But really the best way to get involved with them, I would say, if you're on this call today, reach out to us after the call. We know a lot of folks there. And what we'll really want to do is have a conversation with you about what your thesis is, what you're trying to accomplish with those conversations with the PE team. And then we can make the connection and introduce you to the right folks over there so that you're talking to the right people. That's a great question, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll move along then. I wanna talk a little bit about migrations and what they look like. So some people think when they make a migration to the cloud that they're gonna see some immediate cost savings. And unfortunately, that's just not reality. Uh, but there are programs in place to bring you closer to that. So what we drew here is an idea of what you're going to look at in terms of your spend as you make a migration. You're going to see an increase in your spend overall, and that's in, the, in addition to your data center costs. So as you're starting that migration, you'll have both data center and cloud spend for a while, uh, and you'll need to manage both of those. So we have this bubble of costs, and then as you optimize and move to more uh, cloud-centric approaches with things like auto-scaling uh, or managed services that are in AWS, that's when you'll really start to see that savings occur and you'll have that ongoing lower cost of ownership for your infrastructure environment. Now, what we see here is that there's programs that are intended to bring down that curve and pull forward when that savings happens. So there are funding and discount programs for the migration itself so that the outlay that you have for your team performing the work or a partner like Kicktron performing the work is brought down and credits that will bring in that savings earlier within the cycle uh, so that you can start to recognize an earlier savings uh, model and bring it below that current infrastructure spend as you deprecate those data center environments. So let's talk a little bit about details of what that might look like through something that AWS has had around for a few years now, but has some changes this year to the program called the Migration Acceleration Program. So when we look at a migration, there's a program called the Migration Acceleration Program, and it breaks into three different phases. Uh, the assess phase, the uh, mobilize phase, and then the um, migration phase. And so let's talk about the assess phase a little bit and what you can expect there. The assess phase is intended to be a low to no cost phase for you, where you can understand in detail what it's going to look like once you get into AWS. This is something that would be done through a partner like Kickdrum, but with funding provided by AWS to offset the costs of a qualified partner doing that evaluation. The first thing that we would do with that would be migration evaluator that I mentioned before to get a full understanding of your environment, pull together your entire inventory, and then start to put together the costs of what that would look like. We'll do a multi-year TCO analysis on that, comparing your current environment, both in terms of infrastructure as well as in terms of support, so the staff that's supporting that environment. Uh, and then we'll compare that to what it would look like in AWS with some of those managed services that may reduce some of the support costs that you have. And of course, also hopefully reduce some of your infrastructure costs as well. We'll also wanna look at things like modernization, which would bring down your overall costs and how auto scaling, reserved instances or other savings opportunities like that can bring down your cost of ownership. In addition to that, we're gonna to pull together 
something called a migration readiness assessment. That's a full evaluation of what your team uh, knows and does today, whether or not there's a cloud center of excellence, for example, or whether there are people that fully understand how auto scaling work and how you can use an AWS environment to make your costs more closely married to the customers that you have, as opposed to being more closely married to the infrastructure that you have in place. And finally, the output from that is basically going to be a business case and a migration pattern. And when I say migration pattern, there's a few different patterns that could exist here. It could be something like what we call a lift and shift, where we're really just moving you on to AWS servers, and we're leaving it at that. It could be something like a modernization, where we're going to put you into scalable managed services, or it could be a replatforming, where we really want to reevaluate the entire way in which you're delivering your application uh, and put together a plan to move to a new mode of that. This is not just uh, infrastructure costs. It's not just a calculator. It really is a business-driven analysis of what you plan to do and why you're moving to the cloud. So with that, you're going to have a really good idea of what it might look like. And if you decide to move forward with it, we can move into the phase called Map Mobilize. Uh, so this is where we start to build all the tools. We put together some proofs of concept and really start to deliver on what it's going to look like to live in AWS instead of in your data center or other environment. Now, AWS does provide funding towards this. Uh, baseline on that is going to be about 20% of your projected AWS spend. So during that initial assess phase, we look at what it's going to cost once you move into AWS, and they'll start to provide funding to partners to perform the migration for you based on what that long-term spend is going to look like. That's a way for you to have both somebody who has expertise in doing migrations as part of your team for delivering the migration itself, while also bringing down the actual cost of performing that migration. So as we mobilize, we'll create a, a plan for both your environment as well as for your team. We'll put together an operating model. We'll do something called a, called a well-architected review. It's really a pretty in-depth questioning of your team and your infrastructure setup to make sure that it looks right and it follows best practices. And then we'll build proofs of concept. So you may have a, a handful of customers that will get migrated over during this phase just to demonstrate different size customers, uh, different complexity customers. And in doing so, we'll develop tools around the infrastructure for automation of the deployment of the infrastructure. So things like a control tower, landing zones, identity and access management, VPCs, and putting together all of the tools so that you can automate that and deploy the next set of customers quickly and without having to manually deploy anything. And then finally, we'll get into what we call the migrate and modernize phase. And that's where we start to see the bill credits come into play. Now, the baseline for that is going to be about 25% of your annual spend in the first year. There are some kickers or additional incentives that can be applied to that by the AWS team based on where you are within your cloud journey and what you're planning to do. So if you plan to go fully modern, for example, there's an additional 10% that can be applied to that uh, to bring down that cost. There's also future credits. So the way that this works is it's going to be credits applied for a few years, not just the first year. And any growth that you have after that first year will accrue additional credits. Uh, it's based on a year-over-year -year rolling cycle. So that's where we bring in that savings and we bring it earlier into the cycle uh, so that you're able to achieve ROI more quickly. Hey, Jeremy, we have one more question right now. Um, this one comes from Heather. She says, I don't want to commit to a migration yet, but I'm curious what my spend might look like on AWS versus my current Azure environments. Can you help me determine that with this? Yeah, fantastic. That's a great question. So that's really what the assess phase is going to help you to do. I mentioned data center environments, of course, because uh, that's one of the common ones we see. But if you are in Azure, then what we'll do is we'll look at those Azure services 
and the bills, the detailed billing associated with them. And we'll put together a similar plan here for what your uh, TCO is going to look like when you make that move. Great question. Same will apply, by the way, for GCP or any other provider you may be looking at. Great. All right, so now let's talk about during the operations phase of things. Uh, so once we move into having migrated and we want to start to bring down our costs, there's a few different ways that we can do that. There's a group of agreements called private pricing agreements. And one thing I want to say before I get into too much in terms of detail here is this is a public session, of course, and AWS isn't going to publicize what their discount schedule looks like. And we're, of course, not going to share that type of information either as an advanced AWS partner. But if you go online, you do a little bit of YouTube or Google searching, you can find some guidance similar to what we're saying here. I would say if you're approaching a million dollars in annual spend, uh, then you should definitely be talking to your account manager. Uh, anything near that number, I would say. Uh, now, 5% off of total spend that we say here, that can vary a lot. It's going to depend on what your spend is, what your growth commitments are, and the duration of the term that you're looking at. So with something like this private pricing agreement, you're going to sign up for maybe a one-year term, a two-year, a three-year. Some people will actually sign up for even longer commitments. I've seen five-year terms as part of these. Uh, and the, the greater commitment you're willing to sign up for, the greater the discount that you're going to get, of course. Now, beyond that, uh, at the total bill level, there's also service-specific discounts that you can look at. So if you're using, for example, a lot of S3 storage, you can talk to your account manager about a private pricing agreement specific to S3 uh, or specific to a type of S3 storage, a class of S3 storage. Uh, this can really apply to almost any service that you can use as long as you have sufficient spend on that particular service, you can negotiate a private pricing agreement for them. Now, 45%, that's pretty high. Uh, it's for specific services that you might see that. A lot of others, you might see a lower, uh, lower amount, but again, it's gonna depend on the commitment, the type of service, uh, and how much spend you have with that. I think these are very critical to understand that these can be stacked with a, uh, a bill wide or what was formerly called an enterprise discount program. Uh, they can be stacked with those so that you can get a discount on your S3 in addition to your total bill discount. Now, when it comes to building new workloads, this is, of course, something that AWS loves. The more that you're building new workloads in the AWS environment, the happier they're going to be, and I think the happier you will be as well. So when you want to build out something new, let's say it's uh, a new authentication mechanism. Uh, if you're planning to do that, the best way to go about that is to talk to a partner or talk to your account manager to get connected to a partner. Uh, and there's funding programs that are available to that. Now, for almost any proof of concept that you want to develop, you can get a 15% discount applied uh, for that from AWS just to investigate that POC. That's 15% of what your projected annual spend would be on AWS when you roll it out to production. And that's essentially funding that will be applied to a partner like Kickdrum to build out that proof of concept for you and validate whether or not it's something that's going to work in your environment. Now, Gen AI, as I mentioned before, hot topic, obviously, uh, in 2024 and in 2023, if you're not talking about Gen AI, then I'd be a little bit surprised. And in AWS, that is very much the case as well. They're very interested in supporting how you can deploy Gen AI in your environment in a transformative way for your business. Uh, AWS has some great Gen AI technology that they've uh, really ramped up, especially over the last year, and they do have funding programs associated with those. Now, those funding programs aren't fully public, uh, but there are programs that exist uh, and credits that exist that can be applied. So I think that's very much worth a conversation with a partner if you're thinking about pursuing that path. 
And then the last thing that we'll talk about a little bit is training and tools. So when it comes to training, there is free AWS training uh, for all of your employees. There's something called Skill Builder uh, where you can get access to that. Uh, there are courses that are publicly available uh, that are basic level courses for all of your employees. And then there's a paid tier to that as well that gives you the more complex, what you might think of as a thousand level course. Now, if you do have a good number of employees uh, that you want to make sure are trained up to the right level, I would look at private classes. These are fantastic, uh, especially what they call the immersion events, where you'll have a, a trainer will work directly with a team and they'll basically build something from scratch in a training environment so that they can really understand the tools that are in place and how they can work. Uh, even as myself, I've gone through multiple immersion events uh, and I've really found it to be a great way to get a good understanding of the concepts as well as the techniques to do the deployment uh, on these items. So highly recommend those as well. And then finally, when it comes to uh, managing your AWS environment, if you have uh, enough spend, then you should think about talking to a reseller or at least looking at third-party tools. Now, there are third, a lot of third-party tools out there that will provide analysis of your AWS environment for two primary areas. First one is going to be savings opportunities through things like reserved instances, uh, and that type of commitment on an individual instance basis. Uh, the second component is going to be best practices. And I think that this is something that can be very overlooked uh, when it comes to these third-party tools, but it's critically important. I mean, bear in mind that most companies, if they have a data breach of some sort, uh, go out of business within a couple of years, the, the majority of companies that have that type of data breach uh, will experience a pretty adverse effect as a result of it. So making sure that you have access to the right tools is very important. And there are AWS resellers that will provide free access to those tools. Uh, that is a, a great mechanism for you to make sure that you have the right controls baseline around your environment. Hey, Jeremy, we have a couple more questions uh, coming in here. Uh, the first one is from Ben. It looks like Ben's probably at a portfolio company that is PE backed. He says, we are looking at how to apply Gen AI, Gen AI to our business, but don't have a specific business case in mind yet. Yeah. Um, so can you talk more about, uh, is there any kind of funding that they may have opportunities to just in that exploration phase of how do I figure out what I'm going to do here? Yeah, absolutely. And we see this a lot. I think the, you know, there's usually a case for Gen AI, but it's always important to prove it out first. And having some sort of proof of concept in order to deliver that is just the right way to go about it. Now, in a, a full-blown Gen AI environment, you might have a data pipeline, you might have a large, uh, large database that uh, you're running against your LLMs or whatever it may be uh, in order to generate the, the um, recommendations or whatever you're using it for. But it's possible to do a, uh, a proof of concept very quickly. Um, I've seen these go in as quick as two to three weeks uh, where you can output something with a level of confidence so that you know that it's worth further investment. Uh, so that there is funding available through AWS for those proofs of concept uh, through the, the Gen AI model. Um, those, again, are not fully public yet uh, from the AWS side. Uh, I would say if you're if you're looking at investigating that right now, uh, let's connect after the call, have a little bit of a discussion around what you're looking to do and what your timeline is, and then we can talk about the right programs that we can introduce you to. Great question. Well, and I'll say I know there's a number of partners working in the scenario. Kickdrum is one of those. Um, that can help people explore different types of use cases based on the industry that you're actually in. Mm -hmm. um, so Ben, definitely reach out to us. Um, there's a lot of situations where we may have already done some proof of concepts for other people in those industries. We could talk to you generally about what that did and, and the value that those might provide and see if how there might be a match up there with your business as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
the next question is going back to the concept of uh, the assessment. Um, and this is from Rick who asks, would your assessment account for costs to run Microsoft workloads on AWS, thinking Windows servers uh, and SQL Server, um, if applicable to their business? Yeah, absolutely it will. Uh, so um, there are a few different ways that that can be done. You can have your licenses that you bring with you, uh, and we'll include that in the cost as well. It may also be that you want to uh, license through AWS, and that's an option as well when you do that migration. Uh, either way, our assessment would look at that and would include that as part of the TCO analysis that we provide. So great question. Uh, that's also going to apply, by the way, for any other kind of third parties that you'd be looking at. Uh, we'll, we'll provide that analysis. Great question. Any other questions there, Jacob, before I move on? Uh, not yet. All right, great. Thanks. So really the question now is what's the next thing that you should be doing? Um, and I think that the, the key here is to have a good relationship with your AWS team. There's a whole team at AWS that's going to support you. That starts with the account manager for the portfolio company. They're going to be the ones who are most closely engaged and can bring in other resources. But they're supported by a couple of team members that are always going to be on the case, and then they can bring in others as well. So those are going to be your solution architects and your partner solution managers. Solution architects will look over uh, any sort of plan that you have to develop new workloads and help you to define and find pitfalls or concerns uh, around what might happen when you make that move. Uh, and then partner solution managers are there to really bridge the gap between accounts, uh, that's you know end customers in AWS, and partners like Kickdrum that provide solutions to those accounts. Those partner solution managers will find the right partner to pair you up with. Uh, obviously, we'd love it if you go through Kicktrum, but we're not going to solve every problem. There's a lot of things out there that uh, you'll want to work with another partner. There are tens of thousands of partners in the AWS partner network, and they can find the right one for you in any case. And then when it comes to uh, Kicktrum, you know, we can help with different phases of this life cycle. Uh, whether it be at the very beginning, uh, we do a lot of diligence work. Uh, we have a very robust uh, platform of diligence work that we can do, whether it be a, a general diligence, whether it be something like a um, open source uh, risks analysis or things like that. We can really dive deep into that. And we can also connect you with the right AWS resources that can assist with those diligences and provide some more information like the private equity team that I talked about before. We can work on your planning, your negotiation of private pricing agreements. If you're later on in the cycle and you're already in AWS and you're trying to figure out how you can bring down those costs, we can assist with that. More directly on that, we can also do cost optimization. Uh, so our team has a lot of experience with AWS uh, and we look at things you know, as basic as something like reserved instances to as complex as things like changing your uh, infrastructure environment just to optimize for better spend. Uh, we do this in a way where we're going to look at what's disruptive and what's not disruptive and categorize those for you based on what you're willing to take on. Uh, and then really anything that you're looking at in terms of a migration, a modernization, we can help with that as well. Uh, and a talent analysis. We can work with AWS experts that will do a talent analysis on your team and identify where training would be beneficial. So a lot of things that we can help with here. Uh, always happy to have conversations. And I will say, by the way, if it's something where we're not going to be able to help you with, uh, we're going to be very honest about that. We're not going to uh, try to try to trick you. We will connect you with other partners uh, who live within our network and can help you out on specific things as well. Hey, Jeremy, a couple other things I would add to that last slide. Mm -hmm. um, we have spent a lot of time recently on that cost optimization side with some advanced strategies. Uh, one in particular, we spend a lot of time looking at a company's customers 
and how profitable a specific customer is to that business. And that's something you're just never going to get with a normal tool that you just run. Because we take into account not only the revenue that might be associated with that customer, but the cost side of what that customer is taking up when it comes to the resources that you're providing. Um, a lot of times we find that sometimes there's a mix of customers that are always in there, right? There's that big bell curve. And you always have some customers that take a tremendous amount of resources, uh, but actually maybe their revenue does not offset it. Uh, and so we found some customers in the past where uh, they've had a, a significant set of large customers that they thought were incredibly profitable for them. But while they were helping them on that top line, they were also costing them far more uh, than they expected. And so that becomes much more of a business conversation. Um, but sometimes there's things on the back end you can do with technology to rectify that. But other times it might mean renegotiating with some of these customers that are really not as profitable as maybe you thought. Uh, and that can be a very successful conversation to have, especially when it comes to renewal time with those customers. Um, another yeah. thing I wanted to point out in terms of assessments was, um, oh, I'm sorry, Jeremy, did you want to add something to that? Uh, I just would add that, you know, one of the things that we like to look at uh, when we're looking at, especially looking at a target, um, but really we can do it for, for any client is a uh, financial maturity rubric. So that's uh, when it comes to your cloud costs, what is your level of understanding? Um, and we have a, a, a pretty intensive rubric that we can apply uh, to show the level of maturity within your organization. And one of those things, as Jacob mentioned, is understanding, being able to understand on a per customer basis, what your costs really are. Attributing costs is one of the, the biggest factors and. I think uh, it mentions my patents in the beginning. That's really where those patents center around is attributing costs and being able to understand where they're coming from uh, and whether or not something you want to continue to support. Go on. And those of you with portfolio companies, you obviously know um, this is important to think, uh, not just at that company level, but if you're a PE firm, how many of those portfolio companies do you have that actually understand that type of depth of their customer relationship? Um, great thing to dive into, something we can, of course, help you with uh, from assessing those. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add to this list, Jeremy, I know we don't have it called out explicitly, but is UI and UX assessments. Um, we see a lot of portfolio companies that have uh, legacy systems in place. Uh, they're quite antiquated. And the way users are using them can trip them up and maybe not add to using it and getting the most value out of that system. So part of what we can do, whether it's upfront in a technology and product diligence scenario before you purchase a company or in the hold period, is we can do a UI UX assessment uh, and actually talk to some end users, take a look, in-depth look, screen by screen, feature by feature, and figure out, are there more modern ways we could present that to the user that will make it a, uh, a more comfortable experience and really help them get the benefit out of the application? Certainly something if it hasn't been looked at in many years, which is often the case in a lot of legacy systems, uh, it's something you want to take a look at now uh, because that really can help with not only retention rates, but uh, the value per customer as well. And it makes that sales cycle a lot easier, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Great points, Jacob. Uh, any questions from the Q&A before I move on? We've got a couple more coming in. They're relatively, uh, they go back to some previous slides. So I'll let you finish up and then we'll, we'll hit that in the Q&A. Sounds good. All right. So just as a reminder, you know, Kicktrum is an AWS advanced partner. Uh, we are private equity certified by AWS. We have an AWS training certification, reselling certification. Uh, we are very, uh, very competent within the, the AWS world. Speaking of competent, we have our migration competency as well. Um, we have uh, so many different honeycomb uh, levels of certifications for our individuals in our organization. Uh, as we bring on new developers, we require them to become AWS certified within their uh, first part of their tenure with the company. Uh, so we have a lot here. I believe that we have almost every one of the individual certifications covered, uh, if not all of them. So uh, we have both a, a breadth of experience and a lot of depth of experience in each of these areas. 
Uh, we also have moved a lot to AWS and uncovered a lot of savings in AWS. Uh, we've really been living in this world for, let's see, 11, 12 years now since the founding of the company. Uh, so a lot of experience there and really going back uh, even prior to that, before Kickdrum was around, each of our individual members have a lot of background as well. So uh, I think with that, we'll kind of uh, move on to the Q&A section. And Jacob, if there's any questions in there that we want to talk through, I'd be happy to do so. There are. Uh, let's see. Let's start with this one. This one comes from Michael. He says, uh, one of your slides says that discounts start at 500K of annual AWS spend. Our company is at around 400K, but we are on pace to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, will AWS consider an enterprise agreement in that case, or do we have to wait until we hit 500K before we can start having those conversations? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, again, the there's nothing published by AWS when it comes to these agreements and, and there's, you know, what a hard cutoff might be. So what I would advise you is it's worth having that conversation now, uh, starting with your account manager uh, and really understanding a few things that are going to factor into this. So first off, uh, what your spend is today, that's going to be critical. Um, you can't sign up for an agreement um, if if you don't have some degree of spends now. Um, also, what your growth plans are. They'll look for some degree to back up what those growth plans are uh, and make sure that, you know, they're valid and, you know, achievable. Um, and that's going to be a big factor as well. So let's say you're at 400 today, but you have a very clear plan that gets you up into five, six, seven over the coming years. Uh, then that's going to be part of what you look at and what the negotiation looks like as well. Uh, so very much worth the discussion uh, and, and having that uh, conversation now, uh, at least starting with your account manager. They may advise you that it's not in your best interest at the moment to pursue that, or it's not going to be a viable opportunity for you now, but it's worth starting that conversation and making sure that that account manager is looking at your spend uh, and keeping a close eye on that for when you will be ready to make that move. Great question. Yeah, and Michael, I would add as well that it doesn't have to be uh, things that are currently in your AWS environment. So if you're, without knowing more about your individual situation, uh, if you have a spend in a different environment, whether that's a data center or Azure or GCP, that can be considered as part of your AWS spend when it comes to migrating and modernization. So a lot of times you can get potentially that free assessment or a very low cost assessment uh, to consider that. And at the same time, you can be considering enterprise discounts that may wrap both of those into it in a multi-year plan. Absolutely great point, Jacob. Okay, so this next one comes from Sandra. It is about proof of concept funding. Uh, she says, we're considering many Gen AI proofs of concept. We don't yet know the size of the workloads. How does AWS determine funding for proofs of concept without actually knowing how big uh, the workload is going to be? For sure. I'll, um, I'll split that into a couple of items. One uh, would be a general proof of concept. So they have that 15% that would be your basic. Uh, what we'll do with that is we would look at what you're trying to accomplish. We'll put together what's called a simple calculator. Uh, for a projection of what that would look like. Uh, and then AWS will evaluate that calculator and make sure it's reasonable. They'll have a few technical conversations with a partner like, like Kiktrum about uh, where we came up with these numbers, things like that, uh, and try to validate that. When it comes to Gen AI specifically, uh, there's a few different programs uh, that can be leveraged for that, uh, where it isn't necessarily tied to an expected revenue, actually. It's uh, really tied to an incentive to get you looking. Uh, and those are going to be just flat cash amounts uh, that can be applied towards a, a partner investing in developing those proofs of concept for you. Uh, those, again, will need to have an individual conversation around which ones could apply. It's not appropriate for a public forum, uh, but those are available to you uh, and could be an interesting way just to kind of jumpstart your exploration of Gen AI. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. 
This next one comes from Stacy. She asks, how many, how much spend or how many developers do we need to qualify for those private classes you talked about uh, when it comes to the training? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I would suggest about if you have 10 developers that you can bring into a class, that's a good starting point. Um, you might be able to go a little bit lower than that, but the cost uh, is not going to go lower. So there's essentially a flat cost and then a, a per seat cost. Uh, if you have 10, I think it's a, a very good investment. If you have 20, it's a great investment. Uh, if you have two, maybe maybe don't want to go down that path. There are some uh, sessions that are available from AWS, though, that would not be the private classes. I would recommend you use those. Good question. All right, looks like we have three more so far. Uh, and we've got uh, we got some time to deal with that. So this one comes from Robert. He asks, our current AWS account manager is not specifically part of the AWS PE team. In order to get to the additional AWS incentives, do we need to get a new account manager reassigned to us uh, now that we were recently acquired by a PE firm? That's a fantastic question. Um, no, you do not need to have a new account manager assigned uh, associated with private equity. So uh, portfolio companies will have an account manager assigned to them, uh, and that account manager will stay with that portfolio company. The private equity team is separate and apart from the account management team uh, and can work in conjunction with that team to make sure that you're getting the right incentives applied. So the key thing there would be to talk to your current AWS account manager uh, about those private equity incentives uh, and see what they can do and introduce to the, the appropriate teams on that side. Excellent. This next question comes from Richard. He says, we have many portfolio companies where we don't have full visibility into how much AWS spend our investments have. Is there a way we can get visibility and consider consolidating spend across the portfolio for better discounts? Oh, that's a very interesting question. So, so generally, we'll see two different flavors of private equity firms that we engage with. Uh, the vast majority of private equity firms are going to acquire and hold on to a company for let's say three to five years, something like that, uh, before divesting from them. Um, the second case would be what we call an acquire and hold company. That's someone who's going to acquire and just indefinitely hold on to those companies. Um, and the answer is gonna depend on which one of those you are. So in the case of an acquire and hold, uh, we're actually working with several firms uh, now where we are going through an account consolidation program. Uh, so what that is, is essentially we will work with the firm uh, and work with each of those individual portfolio companies to bring them under a single AWS account. That brings a lot of benefits. Like for example, you may have portfolio companies that are too small to qualify for one of those private pricing agreements. Well, if we bring that under a single a portfolio wide account, then everyone reaps the benefits. And of course you can get larger discounts because your total spend under that consolidated account is larger. Uh, so that's a, a fantastic scenario where consolidation is gonna make a lot of sense. It'll get you more discounts. It'll get you more attention from AWS. Uh, certainly something that, that we recommend if you are a firm that's acquire and hold. Now that's a minority. Uh, the more common model being the acquire hold for a period of time and then divest. In that case, I would not recommend consolidating accounts uh, just because separating out those accounts later is going to be tricky. And of course, if you sign up for any sort of long-term private pricing agreement, those are gonna have minimum spend commitments. As you sell off those companies, it's gonna be uh, maybe wreak a little havoc on your ability to meet those commitments. So in that scenario, what I would look at is third-party tools. Uh, so there's a lot of third-party tools out there. Uh, we like Cloud Checker, for example, there's Spot, there's a few others that you can look at where you can actually set them up to look across multiple accounts and consolidate your billing information into a single location. Um, I mentioned before, some resellers will provide that. 
as a, a free tool with it as, as well. Um, and that's a great way to go about, again, applying. You mentioned around the, the discounts and the visibility. Um, I would also highlight what I mentioned before, those best practices and making sure that each one of those portfolio companies is following best practices with their infrastructure deployment. Tools like that will really help you out. Yeah, that's great. I we like that question some, a lot. <laughs> it, it, it's a great one. And we've had some PE firms reach out to us as well that want to have more influence over minority investments where they're in minority. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of an interesting scenario. Uh, you do have to get some agreement on how you're going to handle those types of costs and visibility. Uh, but those third party tools can really come into play there as well. Uh, and depending on the type of influence they have from an operating perspective, they may be able to uh, have a significant impact on positive, you know, cost change and optimization, even in those accounts. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one other thing, uh, thinking along those lines that, that I would mention is um, th what we sometimes see when we go through consolidation programs like that is uh, marketplace spend. So that's something people tend not to think a lot about, uh, but you can purchase a lot of uh, software directly through the AWS marketplace. And a lot of companies will, you know, buy their Octo or something like that through uh, the marketplace. And that's something where as a, uh, a CFO uh, or a, a financial center within a firm, you might not recognize that you have five or six or 20 companies that are all using the same provider because it's buried within your AWS marketplace bill. Once you bring that under one location, you can say, oh, this is something where I have a pretty substantial center of gravity around a particular provider. I may want to, A, consolidate onto that provider. Let's say it's an SSO provider, for example. And then B, go to that provider and talk to them about private pricing agreements that exist through the marketplace. It's something called a channel partner private offer where somebody like an Octo or another provider uh, that sells through the marketplace might in fact be able to provide a discounted rate to you directly through that marketplace billing. So that visibility really gives you a lot. Uh, and of course, I'm a big proponent of further visibility into your spend. Well, Jeremy, we have time. We'll take uh, a couple more questions here real quick. Um, this one from Jennifer, is there a way to consolidate our portfolio spend across companies for enterprise distance? This sounds very similar to the one we just heard. Uh, oh, even though each company operates completely independent of each other. So that's one a situation where they want to keep that independence, but they still want to have visibility is what it sounds like. Yeah, so similar type of answer there. The, the, the nuance with the independence is that uh, the way that you can structure those AWS accounts is you can still have a separate account uh, for the companies that rolls up to a master payer account. Uh, so that'll allow you to have a degree of autonomy while still having consolidated billing and discounts. All right. And this one just came from Dean. Thank you for this. Uh, this is he says, this isn't a question, but I wanted to take a moment to express our sincere gratitude for your expertise in helping us migrate our on-premise infrastructure to AWS several years ago. Oh, that's great. Uh, the migration was a huge success, and we've seen significant cost savings, a remarkable 50% reduction in our second year on AWS. That's the team's right. guidance and smooth execution made the entire process efficient and stress-free. Thanks again, Kick Drum. Your contribution has had a lasting positive of impact on our business. Dean, if we don't have you quoted on our website yet, we need to have you quoted on our website. So thank you very much uh, yeah. for that comment. I love that. That's the easiest question to answer. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> really appreciate it. Glad to, glad to hear things are going so well. That's right. Well, we're coming up upon time. We've got uh, a couple more questions coming in, but and I promise we will go ahead and follow up with you individually on those. Uh, we do need to close now. Um, one of the things we will ask for is if this has been beneficial to you, please reach out to Jeremy and or me. Um, we can set up a meeting with you. Tell us a little bit about what you want to do. Um, and we can have a short meeting to discuss ways that we could help you identify uh, the types of programs and incentives that could be beneficial to your specific situation. 
uh, and find out ways that we could help you either as Kickdrum or one of our partners or, or somebody else we know that might be able to help you uh, for your specific situation. We do due diligence, uh, technology and product due diligence. We do outsource development. Uh, we do Gen, I, Gen AI proofs of concept, uh, and we help you with uh, all things technology. So Jeremy, anything else you want to say before we close out? I was just glad to have everyone attend. I hope this was a really helpful session. And as Jacob said, please reach out. Uh, we're happy to talk more about any questions that you may have, or, or if you have suggestions for future webinars like this, we'd love to hear them. Want to make sure that, uh, that our folks are well-educated on what's available to them. So thank you, Jacob, very much for, uh, for setting this up. And to all of our participants, thank you as well.